everybody. So we are in John 16, part three now. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's take a moment to recollect ourselves in the presence of Almighty God and invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, seed of wisdom, pray for us. St. John, pray for us. St. Jerome, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All right, I want to read chapter uh, 16, verse 20 to 24 for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she is delivered of the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a child is born into the world. So you have sorrow now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask anything of the Father, he will give it to you in my name. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. All right, so sorrow into joy. Great theme in the Old Testament. Uh, I want to start with uh, by looking at Psalm 30, which I like to call mourning into dancing. Because of this phrase, he has turned my mourning. Thou hast turned my, for me, my mourning into dancing. Um, there's some great lines in this, like weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Okay, morning as in when the sun rises, okay? Uh, weeping may carry, tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. I will awake the dawn. A great expression of the resurrection that you see in Psalms 57, 60, and 108. I will awake the dawn. Okay. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Come and rejoice in it. Okay. Um, um let us rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, when this stone which the builders rejected becomes the head of the corner at his resurrection. And this is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad. Okay, but first comes this weeping, but it only tarries for the night. And the apostles are going to weep and lament. Uh, you know, this is this is strong. Uh, language here. This is Clio and Threneo, two Greek words, okay, that uh, represent uncontrollable, loud, audible wailing. Okay, these are strong words. Dacruo is like uh, silent weeping, like our Lord at the tomb of Lazarus. Uh, our Lord wasn't we wailing, okay. Um, he was crying silent tears in John 11.35. Okay, but here, what he's referring to is... Uh, uh, represents serious pain, man. Not that our Lord wasn't in pain at Lazarus's tomb, but this is uncontrollable, audible grief here. Uh, this is weeping, the kind of weeping that we're going to do. It will tarry for the night, but joy will come with the morning. So this is the Easter morning. So yeah, I mean, on one hand, when our Lord's speaking here about the separation, you know, in a little while, you will see me no, no more. And then in a little while, you will see me again. You know, we're not really sure. Is that the resurrection? Is that a reference to the three days in the tomb and that they will see him again at the resurrection? Uh, yes, it could be that. It could be the second coming as well. Or it could be our own death individually when we see the Lord again. So this this is a valley of tears, as we say in the Hail Holy Queen. You know, um, uh, pray for us, Mother. Um, Oh, children of Eve, in this valley of tears, turn them, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us. That's the fruit of thy own Jesus, the climate of love, and the sweet Virgin Mary. Okay, we are in a valley of tears, uh, literally. 
uh, but it's going to be turned into joy, restoration. Uh, let's look at uh, Psalm 126. You know, we're going to go out sowing, weeping as we sow. You know, uh, may those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. He that goes forth weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Um, so this restoration, uh, restore our fortunes, O Lord, um, like the water courses of the Negev, this desert region south of Jerusalem, okay? And uh, during the rainy seasons, the late and early rains, okay? When uh, the... When it rains, these, these wadi are going to fill up. They're going to become rushing streams. Through much of the year, they're just dry stream, be stream beds. Uh, but, you know, so to restore our fortunes like those water courses. Yeah, it looks dry and desolate down here in this valley of tears. Us children of Eve. Okay. Um, but uh, one day, we will come home with shouts of joy. The Lord will see us again and restore our fortunes. He will turn our mourning into dancing. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Now it's in Isaiah 61, uh, we have the Messiah speaking here because this is what our Lord reads in the synagogue at Nazareth and applies to himself. It's a description of the, of the Messiah. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. Sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Okay. Uh, to comfort all who mourn. To grant to those who mourn in Zion. To give them garland instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. These are the words our Lord read. Proclaimed in the synagogue at Nazareth. As the Messiah. He fulfilled these things. Okay, um, this is the mission, to restore our fortunes, to bring joy with the morning. Uh, so this uh, time of our lives down here is a valley of tears, and we will weep and lament. Okay, but one day, he will see us again at our death when we meet the Lord and see him in glory. Um, he will take that sorrow from our hearts forever. And bind up our wounds. And uh, turn our mourning into gladness. A garland instead of ashes. All right. Uh, we all look forward to that. With all our hearts. I'll tell you. Jeremiah. Let's jump to Jeremiah 31. The new covenant is sandwiched in the middle of the prophet Jeremiah. We call him the weeping prophet. Okay, because he just, his eyes just are flooded with tears. Okay, uh, Jeremiah is a weeping prophet, but there's joy smack in the middle of it. It's like the meat of the sandwich. In these chapters 29 to 33, we hear about the new covenant. We hear about the Messiah who's going to come. And what's he going to do? Well, he's going to gather the scattered of Israel. And their life shall be like a watered garden and they shall languish no more. Then shall the maidens rejoice in the dance, and the young men and old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. Uh, they shall be feasted and satisfied with my goodness. Uh, so restoration of fortunes. It's a great theme in the Old Testament. Sowing in tears, reaping with joy. So what our Lord's saying here in this great... Uh, description is going to be fulfilled i mean yes um provisionally you know prelim in a preliminary fashion when our lord appears to them on the day of his resurrection they were glad john twenty twenty says that they were glad when they saw the lord when he appeared in their midst in the upper room they were glad when they saw the lord but ultimately this points this restoration of fortunes points beyond that it points to eternity our entrance into eternity each one of us individually when we die and meet the lord okay but it also refers to the end of time to the second coming of the christ the parousia okay so it can mean all these things but uh, sorrow is going to be turned into joy man 
Uh, that is a great message here that we're going to reflect on today in this class that is incredibly um, uplifting. All right, next, we have our Lord utilizing this image of childbirth. This is so common in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's all over the place, folks. Distress. The distress that they're going to feel while our Lord's in the tomb, it is going to be like childbirth in some sense. I mean, they are going to be in travail and wailing aloud like a woman in travail when her hour has come to give birth. Okay, they are, but they will meet him again and their hearts will be glad when they see him on Easter Sunday. Uh, but in the meantime, they're going to have to go through this distress. Um, and all of us in this life, you know, are kind of giving birth to ourselves. As we walk through this valley of tears, it is kind of like a birth, childbirth. You know, our Lord said as much. You know, we have to be born again. It's nice, you know, I just baptized a couple babies here, I don't know, two hours ago, and an uh, hour and a half ago. All right, look, uh, yeah, that's nice, nice and easy. Yep. They were born in the womb of the church, the baptismal font. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I poured water over them, and they were born again of water and the Spirit. But really, to, to walk out through this valley of tears, we're kind of giving birth to ourselves. We are in travail, giving birth, in a certain sense, to ourselves. And the whole church is giving birth to each one of us in a certain sense. Uh, this travail. Yes, it begins at baptism in the life of God. But ultimately, this whole cosmos is like a birth canal uh, bearing us into eternity. Think about it that way. Born into eternity. So the whole of creation groaning and in travail, St. Paul says in Romans 8, okay, is like a woman. The whole of creation giving birth to the sons of God. Um, it's an amazing way to think about this whole thing as a birth canal. We've talked about this before, but I mean, it all ties together, folks. The whole plan of God can be likened to childbirth. At least that's what our Lord is uh, using this analogy for here. Ultimately, I think this is about resurrection, and ultimately, ultimately about our own resurrection and restoration in heaven. The joy that comes with the morning of our rebirth in eternity. All right, so look, the Bible and labor pains, labor pains are all over the place. Uh, you hear examples of this. I went through a whole bunch of them. I'll just categorize them. Look, enemies of the great city, Psalm 48. They're going to be... When they come in, in sight of the walls of Jerusalem, the great city of the king, okay, they're going to be wailing in labor pains, uh, like a woman in travail. So somebody who is, uh, so the enemies of God are going to be in travail when the heavenly Jerusalem comes down. Okay, the day of the Lord, you hear examples of this in Isaiah and even Paul in 1 Thessalonians, he refers to this. Uh, as a woman in travail, First Thessalonians 5, 3. When people say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them on this day of the Lord. At the end times, it will become upon them, it shall come upon all. As travail comes upon a woman with child, and there will be no escape. Okay, there's nothing stopping it. All right. Um, so, yeah, you see instances of uh, the day of the Lord. Yeah, both in Isaiah in the Old and New Testaments here. Uh, you know, um, a great, somebody who's in great duress, a person or a kingdom like Babylon, Edom, Damascus. They, they groan and, and writhe in pain like a woman in travail. Uh, when God's judgment uh, comes upon them. Uh, and uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, tremendous uh, suffering and distress and travail. Uh, the weeping prophet Jeremiah uses 
uh, many, uh, many times he uses this example of a woman in travail. When Babylon descends upon Jerusalem, uh, they are going to be like a woman in travail. But again, if we look back at uh, where we were just a second ago, talking about, uh, you know, this restoration and this joy, the meat of the sandwich uh, of, of mercy of a new covenant in the heart of Jeremiah. Let's look back at that one chapter earlier and just look at chapter 30, uh, verse 6. Um, is this the one I was thinking of? Chapter 30, verse 6. Um, yeah, I, I like this because uh, there's restoration of fortunes. I will restore the fortunes of my people. See how often that expression is used. We saw that back in Psalm 126. Here it is again. Like I told you, it's all over the place. When I will restore the fortunes of my people. Jeremiah 30. Um, can a man bear a child? I like this. It's kind of funny. Um, why then do I see every man with his hand on his loins like a woman in labor? Look, y'all are freaking out. Uh, but it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that I will break the yoke from off their neck. And uh, and they shall serve the Lord God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So here's an anticipation of the new covenant in the heart of Jeremiah the prophet. Um, <laughs> even the men are going to look, they're going to be in labor pains. The men look like they're, It's this is kind of humorous almost, I think. But, um, you know, that's, how awful their plight was, the Babylonian conquest. But here's here's a sign of hope of this new covenant. Uh, this branch, this David, their king, is going to be raised up for them. Um, there he is, folks. There he is. He's uh, uh, going to restore their fortunes. So hope. Other examples of this image of childbirth it's all over the place you see it in micah too um human impotence i i just i like i want to reflect on that for a second you know that this is the work of grace this childbirth this birth into eternal life is the work of god from start to finish okay uh it's the work of grace and when we try to accomplish this work ourselves i like this you know we're just we're just impotent it's like a man trying to give birth. Or, uh, yeah, this image that Isaiah uses, it's, it's like a woman. When we try to pull ourselves out of the bog by our own hair of the bog of sin, death, and the devil. All right? It's not going to work. Like a woman with child who writhes and cries out in her pangs when she is near her time. Isaiah 26, verse 17 and following. So were we because of thee, O Lord. We were with child. We writhe. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have wrought no deliverance in the earth. God is going to do it. God is going to do it. We can't do it. We would like to bring this child into the world. And, uh, yeah, uh, but we bring forth wind. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wish I had a whoopee cushion with me right now, but it's just, look, you know, it's, uh, we just pass gas, you know, uh, we can't bring forth this new life into the world, um, this new life in the spirit, it's accomplished by God, um, spirit, to be born anew, to be born from above, to be born again, it's a birth, this birth The whole of creation groaning in its travail, awaiting the redemption of the children of God. When this new creation comes that we're going to hear about here in a little bit, uh, this restoration is complete. There's going to be a new creation, a new birth to all of creation, not even just to us individually, our individual souls 
or just humanity, but the whole of creation is going to experience this new birth. And we could never, we, were, we are totally impotent to bring this about ourselves. God alone is capable of breathing this new life on the world like Psalm 104. You know, when thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created and thou renewest the face of the ground. Okay, it's the spirit of God. Um, it's, the, it's God himself. So anyway, I, I, I like that passage in Isaiah because I feel like it um, it gets at that by using this image of a woman in travail. Uh, God himself is in labor pains over us to look also at Isaiah 42, 14. It, it's interesting. God himself uses this very same language. Now I will cry out like a woman in travail. I will gasp and pant uh, in this description of, um, of this restoration, okay, of all the earth. Um, so Mary and the church, I mean, in Isaiah 66, you hear an image that could be related to Mary. It could be related to the church, a woman in travail, okay, who brings forth a child. Uh, and in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 12, you hear of the woman clothed with the sun, okay, who's pregnant, standing on the moon with a crown of 12 stars, okay, and she gives birth to a child destined to rule the nations with an iron rod, the Messiah, Psalm 2, okay, so this can be understood as Mary, it can be understood as the church, so very interesting to compare and contrast, Revelation 21 Isaiah 66, uh, this woman in travail, Mary and the church, uh, very interesting. Paul himself, you know, is kind of like a midwife or like, uh, you know, has a maternal, in a maternal sense in Galatians, he actually uses the analogy for himself, which is interesting. You know, I'm in travail over you until Christ be formed in you. My little children, he says to the Galatians. Uh, that's just so very, very interesting that Paul, <laughs> a man, a man. I mean, that's laughable that a man would bear a child. Um, yeah, it's not going to happen. Uh, but uh, Paul uses this, applies this language to himself. Um, so it's used in such a multiplicitous, such a, so many different ways as the end times, our Lord says, you know, when he's describing the end times in the uh, Olivet Discourse, you know, uh, about the last times or end times in Matthew 24, uh, he uses a word, Odin, in 24.8 to describe birth pangs, okay? These are the beginnings of the birth pangs. Uh, so a very rich symbol, wanted to kind of survey that, in the whole of Scripture, Old and New Testament, you see it all over the place. This woman in travail business is a powerful theme that our Lord takes up now. So I thought it would be worthwhile to go through all that. You know, we're not going to remember our anguish. You know, that's what he tells us. You know, we're not going to be tormented with regret and remorse and just, uh, you know, sorrow for our sins. It's going to be uh, removed from our hearts. Okay, we're going to be healed on that day when we enter eternity. Uh, we will see our lives. We'll experience a particular judgment. But when we're fully healed, uh, we'll remember the sorrow, but we won't feel the pain anymore. Uh, it'll be removed. Is that not consoling? You know, don't you worry. We're going to be tormented. We'll be engulfed in that joy. Uh, it will absolutely remove all sorrow from our heart. There will be no weeping, wailing, mourning, crying, grieving in heaven anymore. All right, let's hear some more about that. That's good stuff. No longer does she remember her anguish, her slipsis, okay, to be in a tight space, in a tight interior confinement. We talked about that last time, I think. Uh, but we're going to hear more about this uh, because... In the world, our Lord tells us in verse 33 down below, 
at the end of the world, you will have slipses. You will have anguish or you will have tribulation. It's unavoidable. Uh, but one day, we'll, the, that tribulation, that anguish, that slipses, we won't remember it anymore. Um, no more. Isaiah 65. Let's go into Isaiah here. Isaiah 65, 15 says that, uh, you know, one day I'll call you by a different name. Revelation 2, 17, Isaiah 62, 2. But here it is in 65, 15. You know, uh, his servants, he will call by a different name. And we will bless ourselves by the God of truth or the God of the amen. The great amen that you hear in the book of Revelation, our Lord self describe describes himself as the, the amen, okay? The God of the amen, because the former troubles are forgotten. So we'll have a new name. And uh, our former troubles are forgotten. They are hid from my eyes. Before, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. Okay, it's over over when we get to heaven all these themes taken up in revelation 21 no more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress all right there will be no more of this clio and threneo business uncontrollable wailing will make it through the valley of tears our morning will be turned into joy weeping may tarry for the night joy comes with the morning Yes, we sow in tears in this valley of tears, uh, but we will reap with rejoicing, okay? And we will come home rejoicing, all right? Um, so we will not remember the former troubles. They will be forgotten. I love this. Uh, that's just one here. Let's look at a couple others. That was uh, <coughs> Isaiah 65. Let's look back at 51. I think we already <coughs> awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. It's really the Messiah. A new exodus here is, is being described. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing. We'll flee away. When we get to the other side, we will forget our anguish for joy that a child is born into the world. And who is that child? It's us. It's the whole human race. It's all of creation. It's the church. It's us individually. We will be born into eternal life. We'll finally uh, get through, pass through the veil and go to the other side where life truly begins. The higher reality, the ultimate reality. This is the dream world down here we're in, folks. This time of proving, this time of testing, okay? Uh, it's just a little while that we're down here. Life truly begins on the other side. We begin our new life when we're born into eternity. So when that child is born, singing in everlasting joy, you shall obtain joy and gladness, sighing and sorrow shall flee away. Isaiah 51, 9 to 11. Uh, how about another one here? Revelation 21, 4, I made mention of. So let's tie this all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. Right near the end here, it says, Oh man, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I'm telling you, those passages uh, in Isaiah 51 and 65 and Revelation 21 just ties it all together with what our Lord is saying to us in John 16. Joy comes with the morning. So sow in tears, or you'll reap with joy. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Just a temporary, just a little while, a short duration. I'll be gone a little while, but again in a little while, I will see you. Um, now, your hearts will rejoice. Your hearts will rejoice 
Oh, more about joy. I want to hear more. Don't you just want to hear more about joy? I told you this is going to be uplifting. I mean, look at this. Let's look at uh, 26, 8 here. This cracks me up. Genesis uh, 26. Is it 26? 21, 6. I'm sorry. Uh, this is Sarah now. Remember? She bears this child after she's waited until she was 90 years old and she'd been barren for many years. And she finally bears a child, gives birth to a child. And she's like, huh, now God has made laughter for me. God has made laughter for me. I love it. Laughter. I want to laugh. I want to laugh for a thousand years. I told you that before. A thousand years straight. I want to laugh. I want to roll around gales of laughter. Uh, at the ridiculousness down here. When it's all over, and we see what God has done. We're going to just be just like Sarah. To me, Sarah here naming her firstborn Isaac, the one who's going to be offered on Mount Moriah, the one who's a symbol of the Christ, the only son of God. You know, when it finally comes after this long wait, she has to wait until she's 90, and she bears this child. And... And then she's got to chuckle, you know, because she didn't believe when God told her at 90 years old she was going to have a child next spring, and then she did. Miraculously bears this child. So what does she do? She names the child Isaac, derived from the Hebrew word for laughter. I love it. Um... So and and to me this just is a symbol of the whole the whole thing. You know we're mad at God down here. You took my child with leukemia, or you took my husband, or or this terrible dreadful thing happened here. And why is God doing this to me? I hear it all the time. You know I'm mad at God. He and I aren't friends. I hear all kinds of things. Uh, yeah, I got some issues with the big guy. I get this kind of thing all the time. Uh, folks, when we get to the other side, we're going to laugh at this whole thing. Just to, you know, um, this fiery ordeal. It's, uh, you know, we won't even remember the anguish. No one will take our joy from us on that day. I'm telling you, the payoff is huge. Huge. We'll be completely satisfied with this goodness. And when we see just how ridiculous all of this was. I don't care what dreadful things happen to us. When we get to the other side, I seriously think we're going to laugh for a thousand years at all of it. It's laughable. That's my opinion. And I'm sticking by it. Uh, that's what I want to do. Ridiculousness down here. All right, let's look at another one. How about just quickie uh, look at Psalm 33 verse 21 just an example in the Psalms of this sentiment here that ought to you know be incorporated into our prayers this heart this hope that our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name he is our hope and our shield thy steadfast love O Lord be upon us we hope in thee our heart is glad in him so our heart will be glad in him. That's right. Your hearts will rejoice in that day. And no one will take that joy from you. All right, let's look at another one. Isaiah, let's go back to our favorite Isaiah chapter 60, verse 5. Your sons and your daughters shall be carried in the arms and you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice. Oh, this incredible description of this messianic time of fulfillment and this Edenic like, Exodus like, you know, restoration. Uh, this vision of Zion here uh, is just incredible. Um, description in Isaiah and how our heart is going to thrill and rejoice. I like that. Uh, now let's look at Isaiah 66 14. Let's jump to the end here. And what do we hear? More description of this um, this joy of the restoration. You shall see and your heart shall rejoice. Your bones shall flourish like the grass. Sorry, I had a little interruption there. 
All right, so yeah, I uh, went through a bunch of these texts about joy. Uh, let's just close out with Matthew. You know, I mean, you know, our Lord, uh, you know, what we want to hear in the parable of the talents and the end of Matthew's gospel. All right, when he says, uh, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. Now come and share thy master's joy. Oh, man, uh, that's, what we're, that's what we're aiming for that day. Come and enter into your master's joy. Whew. Augustine says, I think that his words, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you, are not referred to the time of his resurrection. So I'm with Augustine on this point and Aquinas follows him in this. Some people, some commentators say that our Lord's just speaking in temporal terms, you know, of these three days of separation and that he'll, I'll see you on Sunday. You know, here it is Thursday night. And he's like, hey, look, I'm going to be gone for a little while, but I'll see you on Sunday. No, I think this has to do with eternity, the vision of heaven. So that's what Augustine says. He doesn't think they're referred to the time of his, resur of his resurrection. Uh, the vision belongs not to this life, but to the future. It's not temporal, but eternal. What our Lord is speaking of here is something eternal. Uh, that's how I've always read this text that way. I guess you could say, you know, there's no reason it could, they're mutually exclusive. You could have a both and polyvalency. Aquinas says, this can be understood to be the day of his resurrection or the day when we have the vision of his glory. So there you go. Polyvalency right there in Aquinas. It can be either or, okay? Could be understood as the day of his resurrection or the day when we have the vision of glory. Present or future. Temporal or eternal. Either way we read this is fine. Um, but it's most applicable to us existentially as human beings in the valley of tears right now wailing and lamenting down here in anguish giving birth to ourselves in this creation fallen world that's groaning in inch veil means the most and hits us where we live the most when we think of this text in john 16 as uh having to do with our own vision of glory in heaven so all right enough said about that uh ask nothing before you've asked nothing, now you can ask anything of me. It's, this is kind of a puzzling statement of our Lord. I mean, what does Aquinas say here? He says, you will not ask me for anything because there will be nothing left to desire. On that day, you will ask nothing of me. That's 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 what I want to really press into. Because, um, yeah, in that day, you will ask nothing of me. There's some really interesting points that Aquinas makes on this that I got to share with you. Listen to this. You'll ask me for, you will not ask me for anything because there will be nothing left to desire since all goods will be ours in superabundance in our homeland. Also, you'll ask no questions because you will be filled with the knowledge of God. Now, someone may object and Thomas makes this point. That the saints of God, they make requests all the time. I mean, their prayers rise like incense, you know, before the throne of God. They're praying for us down here. They're asking for things. And the angels uh, also ask for things. Um, so it's interesting. He uses examples of saints and angels who uh, are in heaven, in a heavenly state. And yet seem to ask for things, petition for things. Uh, what do you do with that? So here's what Aquinas, how he resolves that seeming discrepancy. He says, the time of glory be can be considered in two ways. The time of the beginning of glory and the time of its full completion. The time of the beginning of glory lasts until the day of judgment. For the saints receive glory in their soul, but something still remains to be received. That is the glory of the body for each one and the completion of the member of the number of the elect. Consequently, till the day of judgment, the saints can both ask for things and question. 
but not about what pertains to the very essence of beatitude. The time of fully complete glory is after the day of judgment. And after this, nothing is left to be asked for and nothing left to be known. It is about this that he says in that day of consummated glory, you will ask nothing of me. So here and now, even when we get to the other side, if we've crossed over into eternity, we're still in the beginning of the glory until the final judgment. So we can ask for things. The saints will ask for things until the day of judgment, even though they're in heaven. Awaiting this day of judgment, the final judgment, the consummation of all things, they can ask. They can shower the world with roses like St. Therese of Lisieux, okay? And petition the Almighty for favors on behalf of all of mankind. They can intercede for us and their prayers rise like incense. All right, uh, so they're asking for things because they're in this, uh, they're in eternity, but they're, it's only the beginning of the glory. It's not the final consummation. All the elect haven't been gathered in yet. The full number of the elect have not been counted and gathered. And we haven't been given our bodies back. So until those things happen, at the final judgment, you know, at the consummation of all things, we can still ask for stuff. Uh, but after that, we won't ask for anything. We won't ask any questions and we won't ask for anything because we'll be completely satisfied. Really cool, isn't it? I found that uh, very enlightening. All right, now, um, I won't speak to you in parables anymore. Verse 25, now, I want to read down to... Uh, um, I want to I want to get through verse. Let me just read uh, twenty five to twenty eight. I have said this to you in figures or parables. The hour is coming when I shall no longer speak to you in figures, but tell you plainly of the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from the Father. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Okay, this kind of Johannine dialogue um, or discourse is really confusing. And I, I struggle with it myself if you feel confused by all this coming and going, you know. And, you know, in a little while and again, in a little while and in a little while and again, in a little while. And you will ask of me and he will give what is mine and give it to you. And he will this and that. Oh, man, this kind of Joe and I speak. Uh, uh, I would be sitting there wondering what the heck is our Lord talking about? As, uh, these, uh, this kind of thing is puzzling. Hey, but where there's cover, there's game. You got to press into it. Paroemia. Our Lord speaks in figures, paroemia, uh, parables. Um, now, he's probably referring back to his statement at the beginning of this whole thing that I am the true vine in chapter, beginning of chapter 15. I am the true vine. This is the figure that he began this portion of the dialogue with. So now let's look at verse 26. I do not say that I will pray the Father for you. Uh, this is very interesting theological statement that Augustine's going to make. I told you we were going to hear some interesting things here. Theological reflection, how to do that properly. Well, here's a great lesson from St. Augustine. Listen to this. The natural man, perceiving not the things of the Spirit of God, hears in such a way whatever is told him of the nature of God that he conceive of nothing else but some bodily form. Human thinking is natural. You know, we just naturally think of things in bodily form. However, however spacious or immense, however lustrous and magnificent, yet still a body. Look, God is not material, but spiritual. So when our Lord says things like this, I do not say that I will pray the Father for you or I go to the Father 
as if he's leaving one place and going to another place. And then he's going to sit at the right hand of the father, like God, the father sitting on a throne and he's going to be sitting next to him. Spatial bodily terms. Forget it. God is spiritual. He's not physical. He doesn't have a body. All right. Uh, God is not material. Harbor not in vanity or infirmity of mind the fiction of the Father being in one place and the Son in another, standing before the Father and making requests on our behalf with the material substance of both occupying each its own place and the word pleading verbally for us with him whose word he is. While a definite space interposes between the mouth of the speaker and the ears of the hearer and other such absurdities which those who are natural and at the same time carnal fabricate for themselves in their hearts, in their imagination, when they try to imagine these things or artists depict them in paintings or what have you. What do we need to do? We need to drive these fabrications from our hearts. Any such thing suggested by the experience of bodily habits as occurs to spiritual men when thinking of God, they must deny, reject, drive them away like troublesome insects from the eyes of our minds and resign ourselves to the purity of that light by whose testimony and judgment they prove these bodily image that thrust themselves on their inward vision to be altogether false. These are able to a certain extent to think of our Lord Jesus Christ in respect of his manhood as addressing the Father on our behalf. Fine. But in respect to his Godhead as hearing and answering us along with the Father. And this I am of opinion that he indicated when he said, I say not that I will pray the Father for you, but the intuitive perception of this how it is that the Son asketh not the Father, but that the Father and Son alike listen to those who ask, is a height that can be reached only by the spiritual eye of the mind. So when our Lord says, this is Augustine's point, like quit thinking bodily and carnally. Yes, in a certain sense, our Lord took this stuff up into heaven. He has a body that he took into heaven and glorified. Um, but as the, son, as the son of man, fine, in his human nature that he took to himself, he took that into heaven. But in his, uh, but as, as in his divinity, he doesn't ask the Father on our behalf because he is the word of the Father. He doesn't address the Father. Okay, he is of the same essence and substance as the Father. Okay? In his div divinity. So when he goes back to the Father, when he assumes takes his divinity, his humanity up into his divinity in heaven. Um, and he will no longer, you know, ask the Father and plead on our behalf in his human nature the way he did down here. You know, I have prayed for you, Peter. Uh, he's not going to pray for us. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. You know, um, what he says to Peter. You know, he's not going to pray for us like that anymore. He's not going to, because his human nature is going to be absorbed. You know, it's going to be, how do I want to say that? Because uh, it's not absorbed. Um, I don't know. It's going to be, it's going to be caught up into heaven, his divine and human nature. But now in his divine nature, we have to be able to flip back and forth, thinking about his human nature and thinking about his divine nature, and that's what Augustine's doing. In his divine nature, he is not asking the Father anymore at that point, okay? Because he is one with the Father. Uh, and we may ask the Father for things, and in so doing, we're asking both the Son and the Father, okay? Um, so anyway, really interesting point he makes here. The Father himself loves us. The word is phileo. So it's a love of a friendship kind of love, but hey, that's cool. You know, God the Father wants to be friends with us. And that's a beautiful uh, expression in verse 27. Um, the Father himself loves you. And I want to just reflect on that for a second. It feels good to be loved by the Father, you know. 
Um, and to be liked by our Heavenly Father. He likes me. It's a great song by the Cranberries. Um, some alternative band from the 90s. Uh, but there was a song where it was singing about her father. She was, she was singing about her father and how her father likes her. And I, I mean, our Heavenly Father, that could be a very healing thing to pray about. Uh, yeah, yes, he loved his peoples. It's interesting. This is the prayer of Moses at the end of Deuteronomy. It's a much debated text because it says here that he, yes, he loved his peoples. Speaking of God, the Father here. He loved his peoples. You would think it would say his people, you know, as in the people of Israel, but it's actually in the plural in Hebrew. So that's what leads people to wonder what is going on here. Because he loves always all the peoples of the world belong to God. The nations belong to God. Okay. Um, Leviticus 18.5. You know, he will... Um, cares about everybody. He has other sheep, remember? I have other sheep. These two I must look after back in John chapter 10. These other sheep are the Gentiles. All the nations of the world belong to God. And anybody who... Uh, any Adam who keeps his statutes and ordinance. By these, Adam shall live, okay? That's the whole human race, anybody. Um, so in Leviticus 18, 5 is another interesting text. When it says the Lord loves his peoples in Deuteronomy 32, 3, when Moses says that, and then you read in Leviticus here that you shall therefore keep my statutes and my ordinance by doing which Adam shall live. I am the Lord. Adam shall live. Adama. All the whole human race. All of us. Children of Adam. Okay. It's just interesting there. Adam shall live. Not just Jews. Not just those who had the foreskin of their uh, male member cut off. And uh, no, no. They're all, we're all children of Abraham by faith. Anybody who lives these commands. As St. Paul says in Romans. That's his argument in Romans chapter 2, you know. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, that you're circumcised or uncircumcised. True circumcision is a matter of the heart. And uh, look it. There's going to be some people who do what the law requires, and it's, it's written on their hearts. And they are doers of the law. They're the ones who will be justified. On that day. And your circumcision will count as uncircumcision on that day. If you haven't. Um, if you have a bad conscience. A bad will. If you have not. Uh, had the law written in your heart. If you have not had a circumcised heart. Um, he is a Jew who is one inwardly. So anyway. This is very important. We see the universal nature of God's love, the other sheep, okay, the Gentiles. There's always been God's plan to reunite his family, to bring about a worldwide blessing through Abram. With the call of Abram, it's right there. So this is God's plan from the beginning, to save the whole human race. Uh, we know that. The Father loves all his children. He loves all of us. That's what Moses says. He loves his peoples. And anybody who obeys his statutes and his commands shall live. Any of the human race, any of the sons of Adam. Um, all right, now, anything else on that? Uh, well, you know, the wisdom, the book of wisdom here, a uh, passage we always hear at funerals uh, about the wise man. The wise soul, the souls of the righteous are in the hands of God. No torment shall touch them. Okay, they're in the hand of God. Uh, he loves them. 11.24 you know, uh, For thou lovest all things that exist and hast loathing for none of the things which thou hast made. For thou wouldst not have made anything if thou hadst hated it. So he loves everything. You know, let's just get 
cut to the chase and go right to Isaiah 43, 14. 43, 4. Uh, you know, there's something powerful here about somebody telling us that they love us. You know, when you just hear it straight up. It's not that often that you hear this. Um, you know, so we got to treasure these instances where God says directly, not through one of his prophets, not a declarative statement, okay, but directly to us. Uh, I mean, not something predicated of God that he loves us or whatever, uh, indirectly, you know, but I mean directly when he is speaking to us and says these words, because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. Isaiah 43, 4. That is just um, something to pray with. Um, uh, to pray with. Just let the Lord love you, man. I'm telling you, the Father loves you. He's not an old man with a white beard. He's a different kind of being. He transcends the difference between the sexes. He's neither male nor female. <laughs> he is neither male nor female. Okay, but this is an utterly separate, different kind of being, a divine person. But he begot a son. And he loves you. Pray with that. Pray with the love of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And just let that, that love just soak in it like a warm tub. I'm telling you, that's a prayer. It's a powerful form of prayer. The Father loves you. The Father loves you. John, he's been telling us that. It's not like this is the first time we've heard this. In John 16 here. For the Father himself loves you. He says in verse 27, but, you know, he said that to us back in chapter 14, verse 21. Um, he who has my commandments and keep them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself uh, to him. Um, he says this numerous times. We will make our home with him. My father and I. We'll love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. So these beautiful words of love, we'll hear it in the next chapter in his high priestly discourse, his high priestly prayer, rather. He says, um, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them even as thou hast loved me. The father loves us even as he loves his son. It's an incredible statement coming up in 17. 23. Uh, wow. The Father, that's the end of this whole thing. The Father's going to love us as he loves his son. Wow, that's going to be incredible when we get to that in the next chapter. Uh, but this is exactly the kind of thing that Paul's talking about here. That we have the spirit of sonship within us, crying out, Abba, Father. The spirit of sonship, we are conformed to the image of the son. So, we are going to live in this love of the Father. He's going to, the Father's going to love us as he loves his Son. That's incredible, man. The Father's love for us. Incredible thing to take to prayer. Now, verse 28. I came from the Father and I'm going to the Father. He's been saying this all along. Back in chapter 8, verse 14. Back in chapter uh, 13, verse 3. But uh, 814, remember, says, uh, uh, from when it's like, uh, I am going, hold on, uh, chapter 8, verse 14. Yeah, you don't know where I've come or where I'm going. You know, he's been, he, he's fully cognizant of this. So uh, who he is and where he came from. 13.3 here. Remember at the beginning of the Last Supper, this verse. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God, just like the word of God that he is sent from the Father. Remember from Isaiah chapter 55 here. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and return not hither but water the earth, making it bud, spring forth and sprout giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing for which I sent. So it's going to go out from me with a specific purpose and plan. 
And it's not going to return to me empty. It's going to fulfill and accomplish what I sent it for. Okay, the word of God. Our Lord is that word. He is the wisdom of God. We hear about this in Baruch, in this beautiful passage that the fathers of the church attribute to Christ. He's speaking here. It's another one of these homages to wisdom. But uh, very interesting, this wisdom is personified here. And it's fulfilled by Christ. Afterward, this wisdom is used, you know, again, you see this through the wisdom literature, is conceived of in feminine terms. Very interesting. Afterward, she appeared, wisdom. She appeared on earth and lived among men. Fathers of the church, Baruch 3.27, they, they attribute this to, to Christ's coming amongst us. Okay. Afterwards, she appeared on earth and lived among men. Just wanted to throw that in there with Isaiah 55. The word was sent from the Father, the word and wisdom of God. Now, um, the apostles say, finally, you're speaking plainly and not in figures. Augustine says about that. They're still so far from understanding. They don't even understand that they don't understand. You know, they don't know what they don't know is another way to put that. You know, somebody is just walking in total presumption. Okay, pretentiousness. A pretentious presumption. They think they understand and they don't. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know that they don't know. That's basically, uh, you know, what Augustine's saying here. I think it's it's kind of almost comical, but... It would be any of us. It would be any of us. Uh, we're no different, folks. But when they cry out, his disciples said, Ah, now you're speaking plainly and not in figures. Now we know that you know all things and need none to question you. By this, we believe that you came from God. You believe you don't even understand what you're saying uh, at this point. Um this is uh, somewhat comical. You know, to say that you know all things. For them to say that, I mean, it is a confession. It is a confession. No, make no mistake about it. They're confessing his divinity when they say that. Because that's a kind of a, a Jew Jewish thing, I found. Came across this uh, quotation of, uh, of uh, Josephus on this point making this point that this is a mark of divinity, that not needing anyone to question us, you know, because we already know the answers. God already knows the answers. So Josephus says, I appeal to that God who, as thou seest, is diffused everywhere and knoweth this intention of mine before I explain it in words. So you see, when they say that about our Lord, we know now that you know all things. Okay, you already know what we're going to say before we say it. You already know what we're going to ask before we ask it. Okay, they clearly, they're making a confession of his divinity. Um, but they're acting like they understand. Now we know. No, you don't. You don't. Now we know. Now we understand. No, you don't. No, you don't. You're going to be scattered to the four winds, our Lord's about to tell them. Now, you really understand this now, finally, at this present moment, at this juncture? Really, really. Watch what happens in about uh, an hour or so. Y'all are going to be scattered to the four winds, okay? You don't really have the grace of faith yet. Uh, you don't have the gift of the Holy Spirit that I'm going to give you. When power comes from to you from on high, then you'll stand up under persecution. And have the boldness required to witness during persecution. Uh, but now you don't really believe. It's still somewhat notional in your mind. It's not real faith. Um, so yeah, this is interesting. But, you know, confession of faith in his divinity. Only God is omniscient. Um I think we'll just stop right there. Next time we'll pick up with our Lord's response to this presumptiveness on their part. 
this bold declaration. Now we know you're speaking plainly and we finally get it. You stop with all these figures. Um, yeah, our Lord is, uh, is, uh, uh, has some things to say about that. So hopefully we'll finish up uh, this chapter next time. God bless you.